He said, you can't buy the Royal Trust building on a credit card. I had written one building, 65 million, I'd signed it. I said, could you please call for a authorization? And it was a gold Royal Trust credit card. They sent me my bill yesterday and I paid it and I brought it up to date. That means I won't get another bill for 30 days. That's worth 1%. 1% is $650,000. And I said, and by the way, I don't know whether you know it or not, but on a gold Royal Trust credit card, you get a 1% discount. <laughs> That's 1.3 million. Started from the bottom, now the whole team here. Started from the bottom, now we're here. Started from the bottom, now my whole team in. Started from the bottom, now we're here. Started so, as long as I have like known about like the real estate business and you and I have always been fascinated with the real estate business. There's this one company that always comes up. Candorel. Candorel. And I actually didn't know the story behind Candorel until you started talking to me about Jonathan Wiener. Oh, he's amazing. And you, you, you brought him up to me for years and years. You've been talking about this guy, Jonathan, Jonathan, and I actually knew nothing about him. And so as we began to think about Big Shot and who we wanted, I started to do a little bit of some research on this guy to figure out, okay, is this guy as amazing as Dave yeah, thinks hit he is? Hit us with the stats, it's unbelievable. It's um, So this guy, in the 1970s, started with a $10,000 loan. $10,000 loan. Yeah. And he's rolled this into, let me get the numbers here. Um, billions, many, many billions. Sorry, so a $10,000 loan in, in 1975. He borrowed $10,000 on a $19,000 salary, and he was able to make this purchase. He ended up making $50,000 profit on that first Right, he property. bought a, a Concordia building and turned it into a restaurant. Exactly, and Concordia, for those that yeah. don't know, it, it, it's, it's a university here in Montreal. So right. he bought a little building right by Concordia and then he used that money to start Candorel, the, right. the profit he made. He was 25 years old. Today, they have 60 million square feet of owned, managed, developed properties and they've done 15 billion, with a B, dollars of acquisitions and developments. I mean, this guy has built the entire landscape he's of Canada. Amazing, he's the tallest residential building in, in Toronto. He's also now the chancellor of a university, huge in the community. And now it's not just that he's like this incredible entrepreneur yeah. and incredible builder. One of the things that, when, when I, we started talking to some people and asking them, tell us about Jonathan, the way that he operates is really smart, he's so strategic. So if he wants to work with someone, for example, even if they say no, he always finds a way to bring them in and make it worthwhile for them. He leaves enough right. on the table so they can benefit and instead of just convincing them he kind of shows them and eventually in his own Jonathan way he gets exactly what he wants and that's his book right no is maybe on the road to yes that's what his book's called I, he's about no to come is out maybe on yeah. the way to yes I love that I mean like it's it's so perfect for a big shot totally so this story is incredible because one most people haven't heard, like, if you don't understand real estate you may not have heard of Candorel, but what you will start seeing now that you've heard the name, you will start seeing Candorel signs everywhere yeah. I mean these guys built Canada and, and they've done America, it in a way that you know Someone we, we reach out to says he has such a huge heart. They called him the Jewish Santa Claus. I love that. But again, he started with a $10,000 loan and has built a $15 billion real estate empire. And he did it with heart and integrity. I, I cannot wait to talk to Jonathan. Great it's going to be a great episode. And he, I think he exemplifies this concept of Big Shot and big, audacious goals. Jonathan Wiener. Jonathan Wiener, let's go. Let's go. Started from the bottom, not a whole team. Jonathan, thank you for having us. Thank Pleasure. you. Cheers. So, I'll kick us off here. You weren't always such a big shot. I was never a big shot. <laughs> well, we we you know we may we may disagree on that, but but, yeah. but take but, us back to the but David's right. Yeah, tell us take us back to the beginning. I mean, we all know the famous story of the ten thousand dollar starting point of Candorel, but we want to go back before that. At sixteen, I went to see Maxwell Cummings. Um, that's Stephen Cummings' grandfather. Yeah. We know the Cummings Center. Yeah, yeah, right. and. Uh, uh, he was married to Queenie Wiener, which was uh, my grandfather's sister. Okay. And they were building a large portfolio in Calgary. And I said, listen, I'm 16, I'm going into university next year, and I want a job in management. Right. He said, tell you what, <laughs> <laughs> go buy yourself a pair of hard-toed uh, uh, construction boots and a helmet, and I'm sending you out to Calgary, and you'll learn about management. And I learned to build from the you, ground you were, up. You were like the foreman there. No, I was no foreman. No, no foreman. I was you're, a laborer. You were a laborer. Okay. You were bottom, I, of, bottom of the totem pole. Bottom of the totem pole. Yeah. By the end of the summer, and they put they put me through the ringer, and I wouldn't quit. 
and I could go on for hours on the, some of the stories that went on in terms of uh, having to carry steel frame uh, exit door frames yeah. up 30 stories and I wasn't allowed to use the crane um, and most people would have quit. Did and part said, of you love it? I didn't love it. No. I just said that nothing's going to break my back. Right. End of the summer I became clerk of the works on the job and so I moved up quite a peg. I wasn't anymore on the, on the construction site, I was in the office. The next year they hired me to act as a general contractor for the same building selling tenant improvement packages to the tenants. And I made a million dollars in the six months in my second year, first year of university. You're like 17 years old. 17 years old. And you're selling them insurance, effectively. No, no, I was selling them packages, packages. Yeah. of, of uh, tenant improvements that we oh, were sorry, tenant for them. Okay. And we were the general contractor. Yeah, the GC, I yeah. was running them. So you basically had a, pro a menu of things you could sell them, yeah. and you just out right. doors, And this is not a million dollars today. This is 1968. This is 1968. Right. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So I fell in love with the business. I absolutely fell in love. Was there an love. aspect of the business yeah, that you, you love about it? Yeah, what you love about it? Scale. Uh, the size of, con like I wasn't talking, you know, suit for $16, yeah, yeah. I was talking about million dollar contracts. I was dealing with prominent business people, I was getting deals done. I was just absolutely beyond happy, okay, in terms of intellectual stimulation. I said, this is it for me. Wow. So I was lucky. And I consider the lucky people in life, the people who can have a passion for what they're doing. Not the people who just make money right. or, or the people who unfortunately never find the things that they're passionate about and just follow in a, a rut yeah. for the rest of their lives. That I consider my greatest piece of luck. Yeah. The rest followed. Sure. And you make your luck by how hard you work and how you put yourself into everything you do but that gave me a real foundation for the future. Let's go back a little bit to when you decided you want to spend the summer as management. I mean, that takes a, a, certain, a certain level of chutzpah yeah. to call and say, I'm going to be management now. Was that something that, that sort of, is that chutzpah, is that something that you always sort of had, you always felt um, the, the audacity, the confidence to do, to take something? Well, wait, before you answer that, what does chutzpah mean to you? Noah's may be on the road to yes. Which is your, your book <laughs> your that's book. coming out. Yeah. 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 I believe not taking no for an answer. So figuring it out. I was probably a bit brash and a little, very naive at mm -hmm. the time. You're 16. I mean, okay. right. Yeah. Who's not? Um, I knew that I was going into management at Concordia, which was Sir George at the time. I obviously wanted something that was aligned to that. But if this was a route to get there, and he told me, he said, you, you know, hunger down, learn, yep. learn everything. And I, the, the amount I learned about construction that summer, and I remember a cement truck driver saying to me, you must be Jewish. Yeah. I said, why? He said, you asked so many questions. <laughs> And I was asking about the different aggregates and how, what's the difference between sure. this concrete and that concrete. And I was learning. I was learning like yeah. a, a sponge. And I've always been a sponge for learning yeah. from people and or experiences. So now, so now you're in the office, you're selling. What happens next? So what happened next is they asked me to quit school and come back. To Calgary. Yeah. And there's a lot of interesting little anecdotes within that because what happened was... I wasn't making enough money for my expenses and I was putting myself through school. My parents did not put me through school. Wow. In fact, they made it worse, they charged me rent. Um, they charged you rent yeah. to live at home? Yeah. And why is that? Yeah. I only found out later it was a forced saving, they gave it back to me when I got married. But wow. do you know at the time? No. And so they were trying to create independence, presumably? Yeah. Yeah. And they yeah. just they wanted to instill the value of yeah. saving? Yeah. yeah. They were hard driving. They really did. And sometimes I felt like it was too much. Right. Like maybe I should be able to cool my jets or my engines a bit. And I, but I was so hard driven in so many ways. It was always there. Mm -hmm. And I am a passionate guy. I love what I do, whether it's philanthropy or it's community or it's 
uh, business. Um, and so the engagement's always intense. Right. And I don't mean intense in the dealings, intense to get it done, mm -hmm. to get to the finish line. Right. Um, and then you get to Concordia, which is a, you describe as a part of you, and you it, meet your wife on the first day. Her father, her father said, you're only going to university to get married. And she said, no, I'm not. And she met me in the first hour. <laughs> <laughs> Where, where'd you meet her? How did that happen? So um, I was very active at uh, Sir George. I was the first student member of the board of governors. I was chairman of uh, clubs, uh, chairman of a blood drive, skiing, and all kinds of other activities. Um, in my fourth year, I was involved with freshman orientation. Mm -hmm. There I was wearing a three-piece suit, and this young lady comes, no shoes on. No shoes? No shoes. She walked from her home in Saint Laurent, no shoes to downtown. <laughs> wow. Um, hair down to her uh, middle yeah. of her back, and uh, stunning. And I gravitated to her table and managed to talk to her. Well, you're in a three-piece suit. She's yeah. no, not wearing shoes. I mean, anyway, she goes to her friend Linda, who's still a good friend of ours, and says, "That's that's the kind of guy I want." And uh, she played hard to get for a few weeks, a few months. And finally, uh, we had a date. I was president of the student union in that last year. I had renovated that student union. And I was the MC for Pass the Hat. Wait, what do you mean you renovated the student union? OK, so a group of us bought the student union, okay. which is where Villeneuve had his bar. Yeah, yeah. Um, so a group of, like, you, you were a student and you bought the building? Yeah. How old were you? 20. This is privately or, or through the no. school? Through the, through the school. Yeah, yeah. Through the school. Um, and my summer job that year, I told you I took a year off from Cummings. That year I renovated it. And it's actually in itself quite a story because I kept going for a building permit and a set of plans. And the first time these are all part of the Noah's maybe. Mm -hmm. um, first set of plans, the building permit department said, you need to make these, this and this and this change. And I said, okay. So I went back, made the changes, came back, made application for the permit, didn't get it. This happened three times. I finally, I'm only 20, but I'm realizing that I'm being held up yeah, and right. I'm an institution and right. this isn't right. So I go back to the student association floor at, on the fourth floor at uh, Sir George, and I said, "I'm calling the mayor." Oh yeah, who are you? You're gonna call. I'm calling the mayor. So I pick up the phone. I call the mayor's office, <laughs> <laughs> and the woman says, "I'm sorry, the mayor's busy." I said, "Well, I kind of knew that that's what you were going to say, but just let me interject a few words here, and then we'll see where this conversation goes." I said, "My name's Jonathan Weiner. I'm president of the student union." I don't know whether you realize it or not, but the mayor's running for re-election in October. And this is the first time that students will have the right to vote at 18 years of age. They are going to be furious when they find out that City Hall has been wow. holding up the student union from being able to renovate and be open in September. That got our attention. Just a moment, please. <laughs> <laughs> the mayor's not busy all of a sudden. The mayor gets on the phone. He said, uh, Tell me the story, Mr. Winner. I tell him the story. He said, you come here at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning, you'll pick up your permit. Wow. And he made the guy hand it to me. He was so red-faced. Wow. Chutzpah. Yeah. Total chutzpah. No. It's not a matter of chutzpah. It's a matter of right and wrong. And my attitude is you have an obligation to execute. Right. Yes, okay. but the chutzpah part of it is the fact that you decided to you call, call the, the mayor. mayor directly. I mean, whereas most people would never even no. think to do that. They'd be like, "Well, I guess it's the way it's done. Yeah. I guess we have to wait in line." I mean, you're 20 years old. Yeah, but I also, student. because of the ethos that I was given by my grandfather, payoffs were just not in the vocabulary. And what I was think. what was the actual ethos? What was the thing that just highly a uh, high level of integrity in dealings? I've left millions of dollars on the table for integrity. Can you give me an yeah. example of that? Well, I have two situations. One is where a, a, a large tenant 
uh, invited me. We were working on their renewal, and he invited me into his uh, premises on a Friday uh, at noontime. And he said to me, uh, and I think at the time I was 29 years old, he said to me, um, you know, my daughter's getting married very soon. I said, congratulations. I said, I have two daughters myself. Um, he says, you know, weddings are very expensive. Hmm. I said, oh, yes, I, I'm starting to save now. You're uh, 29. Two and four yeah. years old. <laughs> but I, I, I understand that weddings can be very expensive. And he goes on and on and on like this, and I said to him, look, and this is an open office landscape environment, but there is nobody else in there except me and him. Wow. And he says to me, uh, do you not understand what I'm saying? I said, I understand completely what you're saying. But if you're telling me that the renewal of your space depends on me uh, helping you out with your daughter's wedding, we're not doing business. Wow. And this was at the time about a $10 million lease. Wow. Okay, and $75, and $79. And you own this building? I was a part owner. Yeah. Not a major mm -hmm. owner. Right, but still, owner. yeah. And I lost the deal. Wow. And I told my guys, my bosses, I said, you know, yeah, if you want to overrule that. me, that's fine, but I will not do it. That's and just to be fine. clear, it's a $10 million lease, but he probably didn't need much. He probably needed 25,000 bucks, right? Sure. Something like that? Right. And you still said no. I don't do it. You don't do it. I don't do it. I've never done it. I never have to look over my shoulder. So, I mean, we got to go back to the start of real estate where this famous story where you, you I believe you start first, you leave Concordia and you get a job, right, with Eugene Reisman. The counsel I got was, you know enough about construction, go into leasing, because that's where the money's made. It's not, the execution is in construction, the value's created in leasing. So I went into leasing, I worked in PVM, and then I moved over to a building called 2020 University, which was a joint venture with First Quebec Corporation and Trizec. I did the leasing there. I gained my first 20 pounds in real estate uh, doing a f the first fast food fair in the basement of 2020, <laughs> um, trying out all the different foods to make sure we had the right package, et cetera, right, and get it done. Interestingly, so many of the buildings I had connections to, I ultimately bought because I ended up buying 2020 University 30 years later. That must feel good. Yeah. Um, anyway, I, I put together a fairly large deal, a 100,000 foot deal, and Trizek said, too small for us, we don't want to do it. I said, you're too big for me, I need to go. And First Quebec was Gene Reisman and Ralph Berman at the time, a very small office. They made me a vice president at uh, 23 years old. Incredible. Um, and uh, Reisman, who's still alive and who I've looked upon as a, a father figure, he's a yeah. real Renaissance man, a very lovely individual, but not a great businessman. Um, strategic, but not business execution. Mm -hmm. And that was a great asset because it was a void that I could fill. And he let me go. And so one deal after another after another, when I started out with him, and we'll roll back to 1975, but I told him, I said, I'm not really interested in salary. I'm interested in equity. Yeah. I want to yeah. build wealth. Was that always how you thought about it? Yeah. With jobs? Yeah. yeah. Um, Everything I did along the way was to get to that point. Yeah. Um, and so uh, Reisman said, you know, you can participate. I'm happy to have you participate in the deals, but you're going to have to write your own checks. Reisman's father uh, used to call me on Fridays to find out what his son was up to and was he doing the right thing or the wrong thing. Um, so. I'll roll back to 75 because in 1975 I needed equity to go into a couple of deals. Um, and I had a pregnant wife. Right. Uh, pregnant. We had actually 1975 uh, was the birth of my first child. So. Mm -hmm. We had that, we had an apartment on Nuns Island, we were looking at a house, 
Um, uh, Reesma was giving me an interest-free mortgage to buy a house so that that would really get me going. And I realized I better put together some money. Lo and behold, now Concordia, not Sir George, calls me, the treasurer of the university, and says, John, nobody knows the student union building better than you. You know every screw, nut, and bolt in the place. Um, we've outgrown it. We want to sell it. Would you like to buy it? So I said, sure. I negotiate with him. But you I, said, sure. You, you had no money. money. Yeah. I had $5,000. $5, you had $5,000. <laughs> yeah. So I had $5,000. It, it, it almost rounds to zero, but yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Five thousand dollars in those days was not so bad. Sure, it's true. It's funny because when you research the story, it actually rounds up to ten. <laughs> <laughs> no, but then I had to go see Guy Tremblay at the Banque Nationale. Um, it was then the BCN, Bank Canadian Nationale, mm -hmm. and I figured he was one of my true heroes because earning, I think, thirteen thousand dollars at the time, I said to him, "I need to borrow ten from the bank." <laughs> Did he laugh at you? No. Nice. And he said, well, how are you going to repay it, et cetera? And I showed him and, and I said, look, I'm going to be worth a lot more money, but you need to take a chance on me. And so I figured... What he, credibility did you have with him? Uh, I showed him my plan and my, my life plan and whatnot. Right, but you had never done a deal before. I'd never done a deal wow. before for my own account. Yeah, for so I figured he was my real... Uh, so how did you know him? I mean, you must have gone to a bunch of other banks that... that no, well, the they door. were a tenant in one of our buildings. I see. Okay, okay. So, so he was the bank manager yeah. and I had a relationship with him. Anyway, so he lent me the 10 and I made my offer and I executed on the offer. And a good friend of yours, a father, uh, Jerry Shiner, yeah. who's a notary at the Whiskey time, the sun, yeah. introduced me to a fellow by the name of Maurice Barrero, okay. who was a Moroccan uh, restaurateur okay. and was interested in a location in Montreal. And I met him and we sat down and we worked it through and negotiated a lease. Um, and I started to organize my financing for the takeout. And... Two weeks before closing, Mr. Barrero came to me and he said, look, John, he said, I know we negotiated a lease. I'll live up to it, but I really don't want to be a tenant. I'd like to own the real estate. He had bought some of the Timmins, the old Timmins properties up in Westmount and had renovated and done very well with them. So he said, I, I like the location. I'll give you a $50,000 profit. Uh, would you be interested in the deal? I said, well... So this was a $50,000 project to sell the building right away? Yeah. At so closing. At closing. Yeah. Finished. No so lease with a restaurant tour. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That 50000 we did close. And that 50000 became the startup capital for Candorel. But wait, at this point, you're thinking you're raising money to put in equity into Eugene Reisman's deals, right? But I was going to do it through a vehicle. My vehicle Candorel. became Candorel. Wow. So Candorel started out joint venturing with Reisman in 1, 2, 5, 10, 15, 20, 30, eventually 49% positions wow. in the deals. And so actually a bit of the past, my next deal, which was much bigger with Leo Kolber um, uh, and a number of other investors, which was 5757 Cavendish in Cote St. Luke, which a year later was supposed to be the continuation of Jean Talon mm -hmm. and the continuation of Cavendish through to Saint Laurent. It is now uh, 47 years later, it still, still hasn't happened. happened. That's right, yeah. Um, but I needed to borrow uh, a large sum of money and guarantee it at the bank. I did not have enough net worth statement to do it. And it humbled me tremendously, but I had no choice because I had no family to go to. So I went to see Maxwell Cummings. And I said to The him, original boss when you were 16 years old. Right. And I said to him, um, could I get you to be a guarantor for my financing? Because I can't, I don't have the underlying value to do it. And he said, are you prepared to assign 
your shares in your company, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I said, yeah. He said, and how long will it be? I said, not more than a year. And he did. And TD Bank became the banker. He insisted on TD Bank. And uh, I got the deal done. And I came back to him. I refinanced it and gave him back his note in six months. He said, six months? Well, what's going on? You had a whole year. I said, well, here's what I did. And I did a couple of other deals that ha made it happen. And so that became, I never had to do that again. When did you hit the first one that didn't work? First one that didn't work? Yeah. I have to tell you. They've all worked? No. We've had two or three yeah. that didn't work. But they happened in the 90s. And was it... Was, it, was there a common thread of the ones that did not work? No. They were all different? Were different things that I learned. For example, the forum. Yeah. Montreal Forum. We did. Uh, we brought in a partner that was supposed to know what they were doing. Um, Simon Property Group from the States. Yeah, David Simon. Yeah. And the unfortunate thing that you learn with many Americans is they are arrogant as hell. And that you Canadians, you don't know anything, just move over and... Let us in. Right. And this is your backyard. I mean, we're blocks away right. from it. Yeah. So they didn't listen, and they pulled a, a number of moves that we recommended against, but we weren't a major partner. And uh, that project was 60 million bucks. 60 wow. million. You know, so what did I learn from that? Yeah. Entertainment real estate is out. Why? We're in the business of financing other people's covenants in the buildings we build. In entertainment real estate, they're using the developer's balance sheet to finance their leases. And so... What I, do you mean by that? Go, go a little deeper on that for people. Well, because you were putting so much money into their business yeah. in TIs and improvements. Right. Okay. And... Uh, Ten, tenant allowance, right? It's when you give the tenant. But, right. but $100 a foot or $150 to a foot. To make it look nice. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that basically they weren't taking money out of their pocket. Right. They're not doing bank, the build out. Sure. Yeah. And I became chairman of credit at Laurentian Bank and I learned a lot of lessons on the way through about you know the credit and the quality of of the user because it's not the developer in the end it's the quality of all those sure. leases yeah can you talk about how you build such great relationships particularly when you're at a young age like 23 years old and you're asking for a lot of money from these people how did that happen like what was sort of the what was your strategy there I think underlying whatever you do to build trust, you have to have competence. And we had proven competence. And there's the old expression, you're only as good as your last deal, yep. but as long as you have a good track record to point to. And when you look at the fact that we've built over eight billion and maybe along the way lost 60 or $80 million in real estate, that's not too bad. No. no. Um, I will say there were a couple of deals that we didn't make as much as we thought we would because circumstances changed. Um, but you bring up a good point because to me, the ability to cross the same bridge multiple times was more valuable than how much money we pulled out in any one deal. Can you, can you explain that a bit? Yeah. Um, for example, when I built my business, um, and I'll give you a, just a brief interlude because it'll transition to the next piece. In 1979, I was so blown away by what had gone on here in Quebec that I had been called, I was 29 years old, I had been called by all kinds of companies to come be CEO, do all kinds of things, and I'd always said, no, I'm very happy, I'm making good money, and at the time, I, by, by 79, I had made a million dollars, okay? And that was very much in my goal before I was 30 that I had made a million bucks. Um, but I forgot something, and I only remembered later, and Reisman reminded me that I also had said that I wanted to have my own business by the time I was 30. And that was put away way back and very deep. So in, at 29, I said to Reisman, I said, I love you like a father, but I'm dying here because I grew like this and I'm growing like this right now. I need out of Quebec. And so I actually 
went through what looked like a heart attack At in 30. Florida, in Florida. Um, I started the morning starting to feel a lot like a bronchial congestion and I was lying in my bed at uh, 10 o'clock at night talking to my wife and I felt like a horse was sitting on my chest and she screamed at me get an ambulance and go to the hospital so I went to the hospital and they checked me for a heart attack and they said it's not a heart attack you're having an anxiety attack wow. you must know what's causing it deal with it or it will be a heart attack. Wow. And I went home and resigned. Wow. That same day? The, uh, the next day. Right. Yeah. And I wrote him a note and I said, when you've had a chance to read this, because I was really emotional about sure. it, um, uh, let me come and talk to you. So I talked to him and then I opened up and I started getting flown to California and uh, uh, Bellsburg in Vancouver. They want to hire you. Bellsburg was a wonderful story because he flew me out, offered me president of First City uh, Developments, 10% uh, of the action, bottom line, uh, $400,000 wow. salary, and I think I was pulling at the time maybe a hundred. Mm -hmm. And on and on, he takes me home to have dinner with his wife drives me back to the hotel and says, I withdraw my offer. What? I said, why? He says, I don't think you want to work for anybody. Wow. Yeah. And what'd you say? I said, I think you're right. I went home and opened the door. Amazing. What was it, what was it about that dinner that, that, that he figured it out? What he was just very incisive. He was very incisive and he said, I really feel like you're a guy that wants to do your own thing and he knew you were a big shot. He, he, he knew where I was going and I, I developed quite a, a relationship with him following that. Anyway, long story short, um, I had been working on a deal with IATA for a building on Peel Street and I had acted as a consultant to Reisman to keep it going because the firm wasn't doing anything with it. Mm -hmm. And finally, I said to Reisman, I said, your whole company, nobody's filling in for me having left and I'm not coming back. He said, well, why don't we do it as partners? And so we did a 50-50 deal. We only had $50,000 deposit out on the land. And uh, so we kept going forward and I kept moving and working on financing and getting things organized. Long story short, he had a little bit of financial trouble and he said, well, why don't you buy me out? So I said, you know what, Gene? I said, let's go to Zitra Siblin's office. Yep. We'll sit with Herb Siblin. Who's that? Herb That's the accountant. accounting firm. Yep, famous. Yeah. They were bought by E&Y okay. eventually. And I said, let's sit down and, and um, discuss price because I don't want to take advantage. And I said, so Gene, what do you want? He said, I want a million dollars for a half interest on a $50,000 deposit. Sounds rich. I said, uh, Gene, I tell you what, I'm gonna give you a million one. And he looked at me and he said, why? I said, cause I don't want you to ever be able to say that I didn't give you more than you asked for. Wow. And I did it. Herb Sibland said to me, John, are you out of your mind? Sure. Yeah. I knew exactly what I was doing. I was tired of having been through the business, joint venturing with other developers. And when you're joint venturing with other developers, there are many ways to do things. So you're arguing style in a partnership when that's not complimentary. Huh. It's not complimentary, it's competing. Mm -hmm. What's complimentary was for me to be able to bring financial money institutions to the table so they had the money i had the know-how put that together and be able to go do many deals right? yeah the venn diagram overlap is too much you, you both have the same skill set if you bring money if they bring money and you bring the skill set you actually form the best partnership but that's remarkable but, i mean a million one it's probably worth what fifty thousand or a hundred even if you're, you're giving them a premium i mean right so what ended up happening and it goes back to a question you asked me earlier is i did a deal with north american life who put up the million one to buy Reisman, so I didn't put out the money. I got the full development fee, which I didn't have to split with him. 
and I developed a relationship with North American Life, which built my career because I did multiple deals with them. Wow. So many that it got to a point where, and I loved the relationship so much, that I had befriended the financial, uh, the CFO of the company, and I told him what I had in mind, that maybe I should sell 50% of the interest in the company to North American and we just keep going forward. Ori Fidani built up hmm. a huge uh, portfolio with North American Life, so there was the example. And he said to me, John, don't do it. I said, why? He said, you're going to outgrow us before we outgrow you. You're going to have more deals than we can service. Diversify your relationships. And so what ended up happening, which goes back to your earlier question, I did half a dozen deals with North American Life. I did half a dozen deals with Great West Life. I did 10 deals with Aetna. And they became my partners, and they all had different kinds of deals that fit their mold. Mm -hmm. And so I said, you know, if this deal came along, I said, well, this one belongs to Aetna, and this one belongs to North American Life because it right. fits their mold. Yeah. And there was no resentment. And lawyers were, you know, amazed they could send me a bill for 1200 instead of 12000 or 125000 because it was the same document. Over and over again. So that in itself is, is absolutely amazing. The other thing that I find absolutely amazing is when we walked in here, you showed us a, a, what we call in, in my world a deal tombstone, which is after a deal is done, everyone gets something to commem commemorate it. And the thing you showed me was this three-dimensional chest yeah, talk to us thing. about that. Well, actually, I, want, I have a really interesting story that I, I want to tie to this, if, if, if I may. So um, we did some research on this sort of thing, and I, I've been thinking about, when you said three-dimensional chess, it think, a couple things clicked for me. Um, one of the people that I spoke to in, in anticipation of this interview was Steve Kaplan from Reliance Construction. And, and I said, Steve, tell me some stories of Jonathan, and, and what's, what, what, like, how do you explain Jonathan, his success, his chutzpah, his audacity, um, and, and how he built this incredible company. And he said, well, the thing about Jonathan is this. He's like, you know, a couple of years ago, Jonathan wanted me to come and work on a deal in Toronto with him. And I didn't want to go to Toronto. This is Steve talking. I didn't want to go to Toronto. And, you know, Jonathan kept asking me, and I said, I don't want to go to Toronto. It's not my thing. So Jonathan said, fine, do me a favor. Just come for the kind of the, the you know, the dog and pony show. Like, we want to talk to some bankers. Help me come and talk to the bankers about it. And so I go and Jonathan and I sell these bankers and they were so impressed. And Jonathan called me and said, great news, we got the deal, we're gonna do this. But there's only one issue. They'll only do it if you do it with me. And then he said, and how could I say no? And he said, and I knew that entire time it was always about Jonathan getting me into the deal. That to me is three-dimensional chess. You knew exactly what you were doing. You saw all the different pieces of it. And I, I just think that is- There was another piece to it though. Tell me. Yeah. And Steve will tell you today he's very grateful for me having dragged him to Toronto. I mean, we know that that It ended building. well. No, isn't that the Aurora building? That's the biggest residential yeah. tower in, but in he, the country. But he needed to come to Toronto, so he was not so reliant on Montreal. I have done billions of dollars with Steve. And since Sam Aberman died from Divco, because I used to switch deals between the two of them, mm -hmm. I had the same handshake relationship with both of them. Um, and, and, and really, literally a handshake. Um, but Steve had all his eggs in Montreal and a bit in Ottawa. And I said, Steve, that market is crying for you. You have such an opportunity in there to be one of the large contractors there. We're getting out of general contracting our own deals. I'm prepared to give you my staff um, because we don't want to carry them anymore mm -hmm. in between projects because we got smashed with $2 million carry of all the key staff while the project got sure. delayed in mm -hmm. 2008 because of the debacle. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I knew Steve would fly. But why did you want, I mean, that's not your business. It's someone else's business. Because Steve and I have a trusted relationship that goes back 30 years. If I want to do most of my business in Toronto, don't you want to have your own general contractor yes, yes. there by your side? Yeah. And Steve has never screwed me. He is, he runs his business the way I run mine. Mm -hmm. That's why we get along so well. Mm -hmm. um, there's huge mutual respect up and down the entire organization. Um, I can tell you a story about Steve that, that would blow your mind. Tell me. 
we had a project where Steve, I brought Steve in as a design build contractor for Bell Canada on Nuns Island. We had to pull that project together, which was a quarter of a billion. Uh, we had 17 months to do it, and we had to pull together the provincial government, the federal government, the Port Authority, and the City of Montreal, get everybody sitting at the same table with $30 million worth of highway infrastructure. Um, normally you'd say, well, that's 10 years right there. Right. And they need 17 my attitude months. has always been, if, if everybody wants to see something happen, you can put them down to the table and get everybody to work together to make it happen. If somebody in the group doesn't want to make it happen, you can negotiate all day long. They'll drag their heels and it won't get done. We got everybody into the right place where something that might have taken 30 years to happen could happen now. Well, you, you brought them all into the same room? Yeah. Well, take us to that meeting. How, how, like, how do you, that's a Because they all had the same vision. They didn't know how they were going to get there, but if we brought a 650,000 foot tenant that was going to pay taxes and was going to make the whole economic creation of it happen and work and, and allow the rest of the island to be built and developed by virtue of it, everybody was a winner yeah. and everybody saw it. Steve came in. Um, we had a relationship with Bell Canada that was unbelievable. Um, I was called into Centre the year before. Which is United Way in Quebec. Right? Really. It's like United, United Way. Yeah. 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 So I was called in the year before to head up the real estate division of Centre. And it, for me, it was a bit going backwards. But I said I'd do it. And uh, I told Daniel Peretz, who was my senior guy from Montreal, I said, you're going to learn. And next year, you're doing it. He said, oh, I don't like that stuff. And my... Anyway, lo and behold, Daniel does it the next year. Three weeks into the job, at Sontrade and Michael Sapia knocks on the door and says, how would you guys like to build our headquarters on Lens Island? <laughs> Daniel comes to me and says, you know what, I get it. <laughs> um, so we move forward on that. Steve Kaplan developed a construction schedule and worked with us together on the designs, uh, excavated out 16 acres in two weeks wow. using mining equipment, okay? Built a mountain, took all the soil with the big super shovels and those big trucks with, where the wheels are mm -hmm. 10 feet high. He was going 24 seven, okay? When the steel came in, the steel came in two million over budget because the structural engineer had miscalculated and I hear about it. And I picked up the phone and I called Steve and I said, Steve, that's not reasonable that you should pick that up. I'll pick it up or I'll split it with you. He said, never you mind, it's mine. Wow. We gotta go back to a story because I spoke to your friend Mark and he goes, you gotta tell him to talk about the Royal Trust story. Okay, that's a fun one. So Royal Trust started with a guy named Tommy Tucker and uh, we developed a close relationship with them and built uh, a building for them on York, uh, which was the HSBC building. Uh, I think HSBC is moving now, but they basically, we built that for them. Developed a close relationship, heard all the stories about what was going on in Montreal with the Royal Trust building here and that people were feeling that they were getting uh, building sickness uh, syndrome and they were losing tenants and I said Tom you know what's going on you're not managing it properly could I buy it I, I said could I buy a half interest because I never dreamed they would sell the whole thing he said no you want it you can buy the whole thing I went wow so we developed a letter of intent and uh, lo and behold uh, the deal looks like it's going to happen. Uh, but they had been very clear that I was not allowed to discuss the details of this with anybody. Anybody meant including my bankers because it was, didn't, normally it would exclude your bankers. Right. But how are you going to get the financing though if you don't? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so we get to a point in the deal, and the deal at this point is $60 million, 
um, I get dropped. And no reason. And I'm feeling really anxious and very bad about this. And Tom said, John, put your head down. Trust me, this is going to work out okay, but we have to go through. And he didn't give me details. I found out later they had a client who had $100 million on deposit and who made it very clear they were going to yank their deposit if they didn't get a chance of buying the building. And so if you know anything about the multiplier of on capital, that's mm -hmm. probably $2 billion worth right. of capital for the, for the trust. Um, so later on, things start to open up a bit. Um, they change the price to $65 million, and I am really annoyed. Um, I get told this, and I digest it, uh, but it doesn't mean much because I don't have control of the building. Mm -hmm. So around March 25th, 1987, I get a phone call. You still want to do the deal? Yes. Uh, are you prepared to do it and sit down and knuckle down and get it done and nobody leaves the table till it's done? I said, well, that's my kind of language. Yeah. So, because I used to have a habit at the four in the afternoon, I would say to all the lawyers in the room, I said, nobody's going home until this is done. Smart. Because what's unreasonable at 4 p.m. is very reasonable at 4 a.m. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> that's great. Long story short, we sat down Friday afternoon at four o'clock in the lawyer's offices. We did not come up for air until Tuesday. Wow. We had clothes sent in, meals sent in, showers in the, in the, in the offices, and we got everything done. And um, they said, well, how are we going to have you do due diligence without, because if you walk away from this, it's not a good sign in the Montreal sure. market. I said, well, your property management's so bad. Why don't you just give us a property management contract and we'll use that to do our due diligence mm -hmm. But the beauty of that is that when we buy, there'll be an easy transition. You're already, right, you're already, you're, you're already yeah. the property manager. So they said, great, that looks fine. In fact, I even had a broker call me and said, hey, we heard the Japanese are buying the Royal Trust <laughs> building. I said, oh, shit, I can't believe it. I was... <laughs> anyway, sure enough, we end up going to the closing. So we go to the closing. I don't know. Did Sherman tell you this part of the story? Mm -hmm. No. no. He, he wouldn't he tell just, me this story. He just said, ask He said, he wouldn't tell me any stories. He said, ask John. So we go to the closing, and um, I told everybody on my side, all the champagnes all organized and all the pastries and everything sitting on the side. And we start at 7 o'clock in the morning. I had to organize myself because there was a trade for the money in New York at 11 o'clock, so everything had to be done by then. I was shaking like a leaf, thinking that here I am, 37 years old, buying the Royal Trust building for 65 million bucks, okay? My hands were shaking. Is, is this the biggest deal you've done at this point? For sure. By far, yeah. Okay, by a long time. He's 37 yeah. years old, yeah. think about that. I mean, 37. I, I, yeah. Okay, so I go in and there's a pile of documents all the way down the table. No negotiation to be had, just sign. So we do that for close to two and a half hours. And the treasurer is there from head office. He says, uh, could I have the envelope, please? Send it across the table. The check. And I hear a shriek. A shriek? A shriek. Okay. What the fuck is this? <laughs> I said... You can swear on our show. It's yeah. our show. We can do whatever we want. I said, what's your problem, sir? He says, this is a credit card slip. He said... You can't buy the Royal Trust building on a credit card. I said, you're kidding me? I had written one building, 65 million, I'd signed it. Yeah. I said, could you please call for a authorization? And it was a gold Royal Trust credit card. <laughs> he said to me, you gotta be kidding me. You put all these lawyers and everybody here and you're trying to close this on a visa card? 
I said, yes. He said, I said, I have a gold Royal Trust. <laughs> What do you get points? What do you mean? Get a Hertz, yeah. Hertz rent a, a lot card. Of points. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm buying the Royal Trust building. So I'm using your credit card. What could be better? You haven't paid he, for a flight since? He said Cornelson is going to have a shit fit if he finds out. I said, well, I'm really, really sorry. He said, well, what would possess you to do this? I said, I'm glad you asked that. <laughs> I said, you know what? They sent me my bill yesterday and I paid it and I brought it up to date. That means I won't get another bill for 30 days. That's worth 1%. 1% is $650,000. And I said, and by the way, I don't know whether you know it or not, but on a gold Royal Trust credit card, you get a 1% discount. <laughs> That's 1.3 million. You guys took 5 million out of my pocket. I'm taking 1.3 out of yours. Call for authorization. The guy looked like he was going to have a heart attack. He used to call someone and say, I need an author for $65, $65 million. million on a credit card. So I said, and Tom Tucker was in the room, and he knew me well enough to put his hand up to his face and laugh behind, but knew oh I was God. having a time of my life with this guy. And I finally said, you know what the difference is between you and me? He says, what's that? I said, I'm a man of my word. Here's the check. <laughs> so you just fucked with, fucked with them. Perfect. Perfect. That's hilarious. <laughs> so invest in your employees in every way that you reasonably can to build your business. Great. And the next piece is give it back. Pay it forward. There are so many ways to do it. Get your employees to get involved. The defeat, the strength of the defeat is it's ours. Oh. It's not we're working for the Children's Hospital or the Jewish General Hospital right. or Sontrade or... Jewish community, this or that. This belongs to us. As David and I think about building our own companies, we also think about building with purpose and actually building far beyond just making money, but also having an impact. And one of the, I mean, Defi Kenderell has been around for a long time. The impact is 33 quite, years. 33 years. Yeah, uh, Walk us 33 that years, and uh, I think this year brings us to close to $24 million. It's incredible. Um, it started, we wanted to do a charity run. And we were in the early days thinking Nuns Island, uh, that we would do it from downtown Montreal across the bridge to Nuns Island and, and run a race. Lo and behold, uh, 33 years ago, Susan ends up with her first bout of cancer. Like most men, I look at the doctor and say, what can I do to make a difference? How can yeah, I fix it? it? Yeah, how to fix yeah. it for sure. And he said, you can't, there's nothing you can do. But he said, the one thing you can do is develop money for research so that other people don't get this disease and that we make advances. And that left a big impression. And I went back to the office and my current CEO, who left us for about 20 years but is back, uh, was part of the initiation of that. And we started it as a fun run. Uh, Costumes were part of the whole thing for a good 20 years. Um, and in those days, I guess we were bringing in about a quarter of a million dollars. And it was meant for business. And it was to, for business to show it had a heart. Yeah. And the cancer really affected a lot of families. Right. And there was an opportunity to do something good. We split it between uh, you know, uh, McGill and University de Montréal, 50-50, to their respective cancer research centers. And uh, I have to say, I mean, this year we'll write a check for a million bucks to each of them. Amazing. It's amazing. What do you, your friend says, Jonathan works 100 hours a week and 40 of them are for community. That's about right. Yeah. What other community projects are you most proud of? Um, MATA. Uh, Federation, CJA, I just finished uh, a great run. I was given a hundred million dollar goal uh, with uh, Mitch Garber. Um, and it was to be a two year campaign special during COVID. And we did it, we finished it, the two year campaign in six months. Wow. 
we had a month and a half of extra work the following year to close that year off, and we brought it to 131 million. Jonathan, you know, Big Shot is really about, it's an archive. It's about taking these wonderful stories from these incredible people like yourself. By the way, this credit card story is up there. Uh, it's I mean, we've been through these amazing stories amazing. with these incredible entrepreneurs. That's definitely up there. It's amazing. But, you know, we want to, the, the problem with these stories is they're ephemeral. And they've inspired Harley and I. They've inspired a whole generation of entrepreneurs. And we want to capture them. And if somebody, in many ways, this is a time capsule. And so if somebody picks up this recording 100 years from now and hears this, what, what do you want them to take away? What do you want? What's that message that you want them, the lessons that you've learned? I see it in my, my speech at uh, graduation. First and foremost, be passionate about what you're doing. Don't worry so much about the money. The money will follow if you're really, truly passionate about it. And if it doesn't, you'll find something else. But be really passionate about what you're doing so that it's not going to work, it's going to play. You know, my kids said, Dad, at 60, when are you going to retire? I said, I did 20 years ago. They said, what are you talking about? You still work like a dog. I said, I played like a dog. Because for me, every day was a joy, and still is a joy. Even though I'm removed from CEO, I'm now COO. You know what COO is? Chief opinion officer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure your CEO loves that. Yeah. But I love the business. And so because, and I love business, not just my real estate business. Right. I love business and many different things that we've done. And I love watching other people's success and making them successful if I can. So first, passion. Second, put the right people around you and share with them. Let them become wealthy with you. When I, I built my company giving 20% not of the company, but 20% of the action in the buildings and the real estate deals, deal by deal, 10% to head office and 10% to the field office. So each city was a field office. 10% went to that city and 10% went to the head office guys who supported them. Invest in your employees, invest in the organization and make them, create a family, create, you know, I can tell you, I invited all my employees up to my country home every year for a, an extravagant dinner and a wild day in the country. We did crazy things, dragon boating, sand sculptures, all kinds of stuff that was team building oriented. My wife used to say, God, when are you going to stop this? I said, I'm never going to stop it because it's part of the employee's understanding that I care. Yeah. So. Invest in your employees in every way that you reasonably can to build your business. Great. And the next piece is give it back, pay it forward. So I think that's a full life. What's a rich life? A rich life to me is not how much money you have. It's how you feel in your soul. And if you feel good in that, if you can look yourself in the mirror and say, have I done good deeds, am I doing the right things? If I'm worth a hundred million less or a hundred million more, it's not gonna change my life, but it will change other people's. And, you know, I'm trying, the other thing I would say, and I've done it and I'm executing on it now, and I would say to you, it's the best advice I could give other people. I'm the executor of my own will in my lifetime. And that's a joy. Yeah. Didn't you have a professor at, at Concordia that said, "Don't something like don't yeah. invest in machines, invest in people." I, yeah. It's it's machines depreciate, people appreciate, invest in people. Right. That's my underlying theme. I think it deserves a toast. Okay, I'm for that. <laughs> Cheers. Well, hi. Cheers. Thank you for sitting down with us. This my has pleasure. been so much fun. Started from the bottom, now we here. Started from the bottom, now my old.